My name is Mavis Nemo and I'm the Executive Director for the Center for Health and Justice Transformation. The center was founded almost 18 years ago on the premise that human dignity should be extended and afforded to all people regardless of their criminal legal system involvement. More importantly, we were concerned about the broad implications of health issues for the justice impacted population. Those in the system are typically ones in our country with the most burdensome health conditions. My name is Dr. Jody Rich. I'm a physician at the Miriam and Rhode Island hospitals and a professor of medicine and epidemiology at Brown University. 18 years ago, I co-founded the center with Dr. Scott Allen. At the time, Dr. Allen was the medical director at the Rhode Island Department of Corrections, uh, and I was a consulting physician there. And we decided to create the center to kind of occupy that space uh, that was really vacant of health and incarceration. I'm Dr. Scott Allen. I'm an internal medicine physician. Uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of California Riverside School of Medicine, a former faculty at Brown University, and I serve as a expert on detention health care to the federal courts and the federal government. The center has, has grown over the years uh, to occupy a lot more space, but that was really the incentive to try and draw attention to this critical population that has such a high burden of disease uh, and such a great need. And when we first thought of creating a center, it was criti critically important to me that, that it not just develop uh, knowledge that it kept in the ivory tower, um, that it needed to be able to communicate that to non-professionals, uh, the people in the community. At the same time, to be effective, I think you have to be interdisciplinary. And interdisciplinary, not simply in the, again, the narrow sense of academia, but uh, partnering with people in the community. So I think when I think of how the center first started and where it is now, the, the greatest uh, expansion and growth that has occurred, uh, particularly uh, in its new iteration, is around this partnering with a wide variety of, of people in the community, and in, in, um, in, in, uh, elected officials, um, using the press, so forth. Um, my name is Brad Brockman. I'm a civil rights attorney by training, and I'm currently teaching courses at the intersection of incarceration, disparities, and health at Brown University School of Public Health. The predecessor organization to the Center for Health and Justice Transformation was the Center for Prisoner Health and Human Rights. In the beginning, there was there were just two of us. Over time, we raised you know, over a million dollars and expanded the staff to include several people who are still here now. But in 2018, the it became apparent that there was a need for some change. I was interested in focusing more on the education side. So I ended up working at Brown, which is where I had been teaching. And um, that what was needed was uh, a, a more of a visionary who really was wanted to run an organization. I don't think running an organization was my forte at all. Um, and so luckily, um, in 2019, uh, Mavis came on board and really began to shape the center in ways that um, were sorely needed. When I reflect on the criminal legal system and why having a health focus is important, I think specifically about the fact that the criminal legal system or the criminal justice system is in fact a social determinant of health meaning that individuals in the criminal legal system have some of the worst health outcomes of any other demographic in the United States of America. My name is Heather Gatos, and I am a senior project director at the center. What that means is I carry the portfolio of work that 
deals primarily with the statewide planning um, strategies and our reentry work. Um, my thoughts about the criminal legal system are that it's um, set up to not help people the way that it's supposed to, um, that it directly impacts, it disproportionately impacts people of color, people with disabilities, people that have um, already have real health conditions that they're struggling with. Um, I also personally believe that we're not, I mean, it's a fact, it's not just a belief, I think. None of us choose the bodies that we're born into. <laughs> um, we don't choose the family, the community, the, um, the neighborhood, right? And where we wind up is happenstance, yet the system that we live in and that we participate in um, doesn't treat everybody fairly. Anthony Thigpen, community health worker, Lifespans Transitions Clinic. The lack of opportunity for a person that is re-entering back into society, um, those are big, you know, hurdles and obstacles and a person being stable. Our neighbors are impacted by it. Our friends, our family, um, people we've never met before, but people who are in our community. And once individuals are involved in the criminal legal system, there are so many impacts and repercussions that last beyond a sentence, that last beyond a day at court. My name is Shivani, and I am the research project director here at the center. My name is Zachary Gross. I am a project director at the Center for Health and Justice Transformation. And these are our neighbors, our family members. We all have an obligation to care for and um, protect those members of society who um, have gotten an unfair hand dealt to them. Hi, my name is Brianna Watson and I work at the Center for Health and Justice Transformation as a AmeriCorps VISTA. Um, I think at the end of the day, this population can't be separated from our community and we have to think about better ways that we can have care and compassion for others. My name is Ashley Peniagua. I'm the Development and Operations Coordinator at the Center for Health and Justice Transformation. The criminal legal system affects everyone, no matter um, whether or not you've been directly involved with the justice system. So I think it just only makes sense that uh, everyone thinks about it, that is aware of how it works and also its impact on people's lives from like small barriers to, to really large life-changing events. So one of the initiatives that we've worked here at the center is hosting community cost relief events. And we've done this in partnership with the Committee on Racial and Ethnic Fairness in the courts and specifically Judge Luis Matos. And in these events, we've really been able to um, create connections between directly impacted Rhode Islanders who owe sometimes hundreds to thousands of dollars in court fines and fees and judges in the judiciary in a safe and comfortable environment where Rhode Islanders are able to communicate their inability to pay these costs and judges are able to make the decision of how to reduce or eliminate them. And I think that you know through these events, we've had eight events, we've eliminated $2.2 million in court costs and it's just been such an, a joyous um, programming that we've been able to put on. We've started up reentry simulations, which simulate somebody's experience coming out of prison for the first month and give folks a real hands-on personal experience about the difficulties for navigating post-release requirements. My name is Sarah Martino and I am the Deputy Director at the Center for Health and Justice Transformation. Um, where for the past few years I've been overseeing a lot of our programming um, and in particular have focused a lot on medical transitions of care for people leaving incarceration here in Rhode Island. So there have been a lot of projects over the years that have meant a lot to me. Um, when I started here I was put in charge of um, running a program to enroll folks who were awaiting trial at the ACI 
um, into Medicaid if they didn't have Medicaid when they came into the prison. Um, this was really much closer to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, so there were still a tremendous number of uninsured people. Um, and that was my introduction to how the correction system worked here in Rhode Island. Um, it was the beginning of forming a lot of relationships with people in this space. And we were able to get a whole bunch of people insured, which was amazing. All the people who work at the center are just a kick-ass group of advocates. They're subject matter experts in so many things, ranging from health to the criminal legal system, uh, who work tirelessly every day. But you say many folks do that. But I think what we're doing here is working on the civil rights issue of our time, which is the criminal legal system. Now you have everyone from Ava DuBornay, uh, who are doing documentaries, uh, to individuals like Michelle Alexander, who are writing books about the ills of the criminal legal system. I think reframing and focusing in a way that I think now as Americans, we can really start to understand. It's work that's incredibly important. We're separate from other organizations because we're not doing direct service, but we're doing a tremendous service. People can help support the center in a variety of ways. First of all, uh, financial support is always necessary. Um, in spite of all the money we spend on locking people up, we don't spend very much money on trying to untangle the mess we've made. People should support the center because we are at the forefront of developing new approaches to justice, to exploring different initiatives and programs for uh, looking at the criminalization of poverty, for um, making sure that there are equitable outcomes for different folks across the criminal legal spectrum. People can support the center in a lot of different ways. One being donating to us financially because we rely on the support of community and grants to facilitate a lot of the projects that we do. There's different ways I think that people can support. Obviously we always need folks to donate and financially support the work, but I think it's also about becoming interested in these sort of bigger picture systems issues and committing to play a part in that work of you know thinking about okay well how does the language I'm using um, how is that implicated in this problem like how does my work in my piece of this political puzzle right have some sort of impact I am so proud of this team from the executive director uh, on down this is a, a phenomenal team uh, and um, it's uh, it's working on cutting-edge issues that are relevant, important, and impactful. Uh, and every week, it seems, a different perspective comes up, a different idea comes up, a different... And, and it's, it's like uh, the challenge now is to decide which, how to prioritize the, among the many important issues that need to be thought of, uh, addressed. My hope is that the center doesn't have to exist, that someday we have systems in place that work for people and actually make people feel safe and cared for and seen. Um, and so hopefully the work that we do won't be necessary. Facilitate a space where we can have open communication um, and work at the state level and also at the individual level to encourage um, more folks to care about this issue and really investigate the ways that we all play a role. My hope for the center is that we continue to sort of find our voice and our footing and really um, figure out all of the different impacts we can make here in Rhode Island and nationally um, and are able to set out a course to create the kind of world that we want to see.